test will sit there like a just an absolute log and then she does that by day but then at night Tess turns into a wild hunter and so if you remember last live stream that we did um, I showed you one of our 15 chickens Come here, Tess. I told you she gets a little bit shy <laughs> she'll go right back to her bed so Tess gets um, very protective of our house at night and she goes out and she kills possums she kills raccoons and she attacks raccoons I don't know if she really kills them and she protects our house <laughs> so she's a good hunter but by day she's not that wild um, she just sits around so I'm gonna jump back to the action shot of Tess laying in her bed I know this is gonna be a very exciting drawing I mean it's gonna look like a pretty much like a, a walrus or a seal sitting on a rock but we're gonna make this happen <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna go over I'm gonna position her so all right so let's see if we can get Tess in like some nice action pose. So I'm going to try to think of Tess in kind of in a way where you can see like the roundness of her head. So I'm going to have to invent a lot of stuff as I work on this drawing of Tess today. And so I'm going to be using my imagination for the position and things of that sort. She's going to be moving around quite a bit. So I'll use a lot of shapes to lock her in. So with that, let's jump over to our drawing. Good girl. <laughs> you can lay down, Tess. Now I gotta get Tess to lay down. Go ahead, go lay down. Go lay down. Come on, Tess. Go lay down. Go lay down. Go lay down. Alright, so get your pencils out, get everything ready. Uh, hopefully, Tess will resume her position at some point soon. And with that, we are gonna jump over to our paper. So to begin with, I usually have like a B pencil or two B pencil, something like that. And I'm going to give you kind of like a side shot of me working today. So you can see me like working from the side. So, all right. So what I'm going to do is the first thing I'm going to do is as ever the windshield wiper grip. I know I talk about this so much, but go ahead and hold your pencil in the air and move it from your shoulder right here. Just get like kind of like your arm moving like that. That helps out a lot. Like, so I know it sounds silly to do this like in the air, but before I practice the violin or play, um, I actually kind of like move my hand around, just kind of like open my arm up. So in the same way, as we jump over here, we're opening our arm up and now we're just going to start to kind of like, we're going to focus on like the big shapes with Tess. So I'm looking at her right here. And let's say like that's roughly going to be her head. I may be um, changing the shape of this altogether, but for right now, that's good enough. That's her head right there. This is going to be her body right over here. All right, so there's Tess's body. And let's say this is going to be one of her legs. So it's kind of like a circle. Um, this is over here, kind of like an egg, right? And then over here, we're going to have like the square of her, um, of her like front of her body. So it's like, these are all very loose exploratory shapes. Don't get too um, caught up with like what they exactly have to be. Because if you get too caught up with like the exactitude of anything here, you're gonna really get very stiff and you don't want that. You wanna stay very loose. So whenever you draw a dog, whenever you draw um, any animal, what you wanna do, and if you notice in the background, my art studio is right near a fire department. <laughs> so you hear those sirens going by. Um, so whenever you're drawing an animal, you wanna think of like the limbs and things of that sort almost as being like pipes or like even like little like, like cubes or something of that sort. So like, if you can draw like, let's say a cube like this going into the distance, then you can understand how a dog's paw will extend towards you like that. So look at my hand right here. So my hand right here is kind of like a cube going like into, uh, towards you and then retreating away. In a similar way, I'm thinking of Tess's paw as kind of being like a cube that's going away like that. So jumping over to here, I'm thinking of this paw is almost being like a cube that goes away. And then there's a turn right here. All right, so now I have the front two legs. Let's 
Um, here's the bowl of her skull right here. And now let's grab, let's put like a cone onto the front of her face so that we can think of the geometric essence of her skull. So one of the things I um, was looking forward to with today's live stream is talking a little bit about animal anatomy. And so I have right here a beautiful, this is a deer skull um, that one of my sons bought when he went away to a camp and he brought it back for me. He's like, dad, I knew that you would love this for your studio. And he was right. I do love this. And so look at the shapes um, of this deer skull. So this right here can be considered to be like kind of like a sphere. And then this coming off is kind of like a cone. Like those are, that's one way you could think of it. Another person will look at it and be like, no, I see it more as being like one big, almost like triangle. That's valid as well. But uh, Tess kind of has like a big round shape to her face and then more of a distinct cone than this deer does, which is a little bit sharper in its features. But it's very useful to like look at the, the skeletal essence of something so that you get an idea of the, the geometric shapes that underlie the complexity of nature around us. So I'm going to jump over, putting my skull back, I'm going to jump over and I'm going to right here, I'm going to draw another paw coming this way. So if you want to, again, think of what I'm doing right here, which could be a little bit confusing, it's almost as if going back to this illustration up here, if you know how to draw like pipes and cubes and things of those sorts, um, changing angles. You see how I'm creating like a zigzag here of like different shapes. It's like up, down, up, down. So if you know how to do that, then you can draw anything like, let's say a dog's paw or a snake or anything of that sort. So I'm just creating like this zigzag pattern so that I could illustrate to you how a dog's paw is going to go like this. It's going to turn like that. So let me just erase this away so it doesn't like visually clutter up our drawing. Now let's jump back to the main part of the drawing. All right, now we have the back of the of Tessa's body. So the back of Tessa's body right here, you can almost think of this as being her hip area. And then up here is her knee. And it could get a little bit difficult, so I'm not going to go into that too much. But we're going to think of this as being her upper leg right here. And then this is almost like her ankle and comes down like so. Now I'm going to jump over to the other leg, which is beside it. And again, I have, I'm thinking of the legs as being that zigzag pattern. And there we go with our zigzag pattern. And now let's give her, her tail is coming off here. Let's go like around like that. And okay. So now what we do is, when we've, when we're done kind of like exploring, what we want to do is we want to pull out something like, let's say an eraser and with a, a soft kneaded eraser, we want to just clean up some of the lines so that it's not so visually cluttered. So what I'm doing right now, if you see this area right here, I'm just going to erase away a little bit so that you could see this somewhat better. See that? Then I'm going to erase away inside of here. I'm still keeping the big shapes intact. But where they overlap, I just kind of clean it up a little bit, just like so. All right, so now that I have all this roughly mapped out, I can start to go into some of the smaller details. So like a smaller detail would be, let's say, the ear. So Tessa's ear kind of comes down like so. And it's almost like Tess has the ear is almost like a triangle just clipped at the end like that. Then I'm going to go to the back of Tessa's head. Maybe um, as I'm working, I don't want the head to get too big. So I might bring the ear in just a little bit more over here and then bring her ear over somewhat. I just don't want to run off the page this way too much. Okay. So now I'm going to get the front of Tessa's face. The front of her face kind of turns like so. And then her nose comes down pretty sharp. And 
I made the nose a little bit longer. That doesn't matter. This is the stage in which you start clipping things and making it work. All right, so that's the front of her nose right there. Um, let's go over to her eye because as soon as you can get the eye in, um, it kind of gives like to the rest of the drawing a sense of the scale. So like when you put a head in of any creature and the eye um, isn't in yet, it's kind of hard to figure out how big that head actually is. But once you get that eye locked in, then you can feel the scale of the whole entire thing. So, okay, so now I'm gonna get the nose. So her nose is nothing more than just like a dark patch right here. So there is her nose. And the back of her head right here. And this comes, this is right here, basically like her shoulder. So here's the back of her neck. And then it kind of like jumps over to her shoulder right here. So what's amazing is that animal anatomy is so similar to like the anatomy of like a grasshopper, which is so similar to the anatomy of a human in, an, in a certain sense. And people could say like, no, that's like, it sounds so crazy. But the motion that we all come up with, like let's say a grasshopper springing really powerfully, really quickly, that's because a grasshopper will have a massive, massive back leg to allow it to just jump like, you know, if it were a human, it would probably be jumping hundreds of feet in the air. And so it has all that potential energy stored up in these massive back legs. Tess has kind of a big back leg, but it's not that big. Um, all right, so I placed the back leg over here a little bit too far over. It comes closer to her nose, I think. So I'm gonna move that over. And again, I don't beat myself up for mistakes that I made in the early moments of the drawing because that's the best I knew how to do in that moment. And so now as my idea of what the drawing is clarifies, I just simply kind of like modify it as I go along. Which brings me over to a, a point that I think um, is really good for you guys to think about as you work. If you try to be too perfect in the beginning and you don't explore and find those shapes, it could cause you to seize up and like never get any information down at all. So you want to allow yourself kind of like an exploratory session as you're playing. You want to allow yourself to like kind of meander a little bit. So I wanted to share with you guys one of the things that I do on a weekly basis so that I can, as best I can, be the best teacher, the best instructor as I work with you. So I myself on my end, I play the Irish fiddle and I take lessons with a world famous Irish fiddler, not because I deserve to, but because this guy is gracious and his name is Martin Hayes. And when Martin and I start our lessons, we do it on Zoom. And when we start our lessons, he always has me open up my arms like that. And then as we play a tune, he says, Kevin, just like explore that tune a little bit. Just like, don't get so caught up in the specifics of the notes. Just kind of like play the fiddle for a little bit, open up. And then you can start like finding that tune specifically. And he recommends that for every session of playing Irish music. And I love that. I think that's so great. And so when I teach you guys, I kind of want you guys to like open up, loosen up, and to feel your arm like, you know, somewhat like moving around. If you start out like this and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm going to make a mistake if I don't get this correct. Then the whole drawing gets like really tight. But you want to keep the drawing like exploratory. So I, I always go back to that exploratory sense. Okay, so here's the back of Tessa's foot right here. Um, starting to like kind of sort of take place, uh, take shape. So let's say this is her other foot right here. And this kind of comes down like that. All right, so now we have her front foot right here. I think this, this paw over here is, is a little bit too small. So like, let's make this a little bit bigger. Again, there's no way I would know that until I got this all locked in. So we have a comment right here uh, from the McAvoy Atelier, which sounds like it's coming from my house, saying an Irish fiddle is an Irish 
violin. That's responding to Daniel who said, what is an Irish, and I th I'm not sure if he meant to write fiddle or it sounds like a different thing there. So an Irish fiddle is the same thing as a violin. It's just all about how you play it. And so Irish fiddle music is actually really, it's in a way, it's some of the oldest music on earth. Some of the tunes I play, um, they know that they're hundreds of years old to even beyond hundreds of years old. Some people try to notate them like, like all the way back before Renaissance ages in the medieval period. So it's kind of like Irish music is in a way kind of like a pre Renaissance or Renaissance age music. So I love, love playing Irish music. All right, so here is the top of the head of Tessa's head right here. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of change gears. So I had you start out like big and broad and open. We just search for all the big shapes, right? And then now we're gonna take our pencil. We're gonna kind of switch from this position right here and we're gonna hold our pencil like that. So this is when we get specific. Um, it doesn't stay big and broad forever. You want to start getting specific at a certain point. So there we go right here. I'm going to go back, let's say to the eye. And I just love, Tess has kind of like somewhat like sad kind of droopy dog eyes. Like some dogs eyes um, are absolutely crazy and they have like this like nervous energy. Some dogs have more like melancholy eyes and she's on the melancholy side of things. And so her eyes are pretty dark. And so I'm just gonna leave a little tiny glint in her eye. But generally speaking, that's gonna be her eye right there. And of course, I'll develop that further as my idea of what the drawing is develops. But that works for right there. Now I'm going to go, let's say, let's go over to the ear. And I think for her ear, we can just go ahead and put in that big, broad shape for her ear. And there we have her big broad shape of her ear. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to carve out like a specific shape for her ear. So you can like see how it like it, how it like kind of like turns with like something that's definite. It's not just like vague. So we went from that big broad triangle to now getting like kind of like little like moments of like where the cartilage turns. And then it goes up here. So Tess, my wonderful dog here, Tess is a rescue dog and we got her from an animal shelter here on Long Island. And the only bad thing about getting a rescue dog is that that dog, <laughs> that dog could quite possibly for the rest of its life, um, if you're the one who did the rescuing, then you might be that dog's savior for the rest of its life. So for some reason, Tess really, really is attached to me. And I'd say she's also probably attached to my son Quinlan, but she just doesn't give much time of day to other people, sometimes to my wife. Um, if my wife takes her on walks, she gets attached to her. But she's a very, very loyal dog to me. She's been that way ever since I walked into the shelter to rescue her. She was a tiny little pup back then. All right, so uh, actually it wasn't Port Jeff Animal Rescue. It was the North Shore Animal League. I forget the name of that town. Um, I don't know if it's Carl Place, I forget. Um, yeah, so the North Shore Animal League. So, okay, so now I have like kind of like those dark patches on her face. Um, her lip over here is nothing more than kind of like this like droopy dark lip down here, like so. And then it comes over, kind of disappears, and then it comes back right there. Now here is Tess's nose. It's nothing more than just a dark patch right there. Um, I'm going to get the front of her face. So whenever you're trying to um, draw like a person or something, you never want to go just for the face and ignore everything else. But I, I go for the face, I go for the head, and then I go for the whole entire body. And then once I've kind of like mapped out the whole body, then I go back to the face and I do find specifics within the face. 
So it's kind of like a back forth, back forth, where I get detail in the overall, then I go back to the specific, and then I go back to the overall. So we're about to go back to the overall. We're not quite there yet, but we're just about there. All right, so I'm happy with the face and how that's looking. Um, now is the time in which, if I wanna go back to the overall, maybe her head is feeling a little bit small for her body. So maybe I did, after all, make this over here a little bit too big. So I can just like, again, like I allow myself to make mistakes because I prefer the spontaneity of exploring to find the shapes of something than the rigidity of like over measuring and getting like really, really super precise early on. So here is kind of like in a way her, her shoulder, this is her upper arm, this is her lower arm. And I'm going to make that paw a little bit smaller after all. So, okay, so now her proportions are feeling better again. Okay, with that, what I'm going to do is I am going to grab some graphite powder. So if you don't have graphite powder, I'm gonna show you on half the drawing what you can do if you, not many people own graphite powder, although it's, you can buy it online, just simply look up artist drawing graphite powder. It comes in like a little pouch. But I'm gonna show you how to do the, um, the shading on Tess um, in a broad sense with a pencil or with graphite powder. So if, again, if you don't have graphite powder, don't worry about it. But if you do have it, then you can do, you can do the whole drawing uh, with graphite powder. Okay, so what I do is I get like kind of a darker pencil. So like, let's say this right here, let me find like a 2B pencil. So I'm just going through right here. This is a 2B pencil. Maybe I'm gonna sharpen it. And I'm just going to go like this. So I'm going to show you how you can just hold the pencil like this and you can kind of like, you see how I'm drawing like very loose right here. I'm not drawing like this, like, and I'm not drawing like, you know, too broad. I'm just going to like, like that. I'm going to send the front of her into shadow over here so that you can see the whole front of her going into shadow. So there we go right there. Then what you can do is you can take your finger and you can blend that in. So you can't do this if you have a very sharp, I mean, a, I'm sorry, a very hard pencil. So a hard pencil won't allow you to do this, but a soft pencil will allow you to do it. So you see how my fingers get really dark right there? Now the other approach is to go over to, there's Tess kind of like moving around a little bit on us. <laughs> um, you can go over to your graphite powder, which I have right over here. And I take the graphite powder and I just drop it in my hand like that. Come back to my drawing. Here's my graphite powder. And now what I do is I can move over big broad areas with a graphite powder, kind of like in a quicker way. So if light is coming from here in the drawing, then that means that a lot of the front of her is gonna be in shadow. So I'm just gonna kind of like smush a lot of the front of her into shadow. So again, no worries if you don't have graphite powder. You can do all of this with a pencil. So as you can see with graphite powder, sometimes it gets a little bit too dark too quick. Um, I don't worry about that because I can always take the eraser and just kind of like bring it back again. So, okay, so that's it for the graphite powder. I'm gonna throw this back into my little dish right here. I'll wipe my hands off to the best of my ability. It's never really going to get too clean. So I go home every night and I have graphite like all over my hands. And just last night, I think it was Quinlan, I'm like, I have my hand like this and he's like, what's on the side of your hand? He's like, oh, because I go home and I have that on the side of my hand every day. <laughs> so, okay. So now, like let's say over here it got a little bit too dark. You could just pull it back with an eraser. You can just go like this. You can kind of like tap it, you can kind of pull on it. Um, but I'm gonna be modifying all these values a lot. So I'm not gonna really worry about it too much. All right, so I see a comment here and Daniel was asking, what about nostrils? Um, I can't really see Tess's nostrils from a distance. Um, so what I don't see, I don't draw. So that's an important uh, question. That's a great question, Daniel because sometimes we put too much information as artists 
in where we can't see all that information and it makes the drawing looks car look cartoonish. And so it's actually a really great question, Daniel, because um, when I moved to Europe to study drawing and painting, one of their real, um, a very important focus for them was they would say over and over again, if you can't see it, don't draw it. If you can't see it, don't paint it. So if you are sitting in a room right now, all of you, and if there's an area of the room that's a little bit more in shadow, like maybe underneath a couch or inside of a bookshelf or underneath like a cabinet, and it's a little bit more in shadow, notice how when something goes in the shadow, you can't see detail all that well. So when something goes into the dark areas, our eye doesn't pick up on the detail. Now, if you really focus on the shadow, you can see some detail in there, but your eye doesn't naturally want to. So the way that artists were taught through the classical period all the way up to like Impressionism was if you can't see the detail, don't paint it. So what I will do is I will draw something in the biggest, broadest masses. And then as time goes by, um, later in the drawing, I'll put a little bit of detail in because if I look close, I can see some, but generally speaking, when I'm drawing and when I'm painting, I try to not see too much detail, which kind of sounds crazy. I try to go where there's high contrast and where, yeah, where there's high contrast. So, and then later, later, later in the drawing, I'll be like, oh, I can see a little bit of information in Tessa's nostril and I will put that in, but that's later. So that's a great question. All right, so jumping back to this, I am going to, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to carve out the outside of her body right here. She has like these like kind of like fluffy hairs coming off over here. So I'm going to try to get like that feeling of her coat like turning right over here. Um, here's the back of her neck and the back of her neck kind of has again these like fluffy hairs. And so I'm just going to kind of put those fluffy hairs right here coming off. Then maybe I might even go back to the ear again, lock that in a little bit better, the top of the head, lock that in a little bit better. And so as you start to like define the outermost boundary, you can start to see the drawing really come alive. So let's say the front of her head right here, she might have like sharper, darker line right here. And then there's this like tuft of like fluffy hair right where almost like a human eyebrow would be. And that's kind of cool looking and that gives her like a little bit more of an alert look there. So there is the slope of her nose. It's, she's got a pretty straight snout right here coming back. Maybe we'll strengthen the dark, make this a little bit darker. And now what I do is I get, this is nothing more than just a sharp eraser. It's kind of like this eraser right here, but, but sharper and so, and smaller. So what I'll do is I'll carve, the outside of the dark of that nose with that sharp eraser. And you see how that pops it off more? So you can use the light behind something dark to like carve it out. And so now that feels like really sharp and crisp. So I really like what's happening right there. Now I'm gonna get a lighter pencil. So this part of her body is pretty light. So now I'm gonna get a lighter pencil. This is an H pencil. I'm going to uh, just sharpen it a little bit. So I have my sandpaper. If you don't have sandpaper, uh, just use a sharpener like this and get it as sharp as you can with the sharpener. Like, don't worry about like letting like all the materials that I have hold you back. Just, you wanna get a sharp lighter pencil if possible. And now I'm gonna find the back of her, it's kind of like, it's kind of like her side right there. It's like, her side leading to like the haunch of her body right there. So now it turns a little bit. You see how I overshot right here? I'm totally fine with overshooting because again, it was just my best guess as the drawing was in an early stage. And then I erase away like that. Now it turns down here. Maybe here comes the tail right there. Okay, now I'm gonna get the curve of her leg right here. And that curves in like so. Here is 
the back part of her leg right here. And that turns in like so. So now I'm gonna, I'm starting to see the whole thing really lock in. So this is typically what happens with the drawing where I search around for a little while. It's like half hour, 40 minutes of searching. And then the shapes start clarifying. So, okay, I'm gonna get the other back leg here. And she has these dark pads on the underside of her paw. And those pads are like practically black when she was a little pup. They were kind of like pink, but now I think she's ran a lot of miles on the dirt in her backyard. All right, so there is the underside of her body. And I'm just going to indicate kind of the turn of her leg there. All right, so now I'm going over to, this is like her front elbow. And so I'm going to find that front elbow, roughly like right there. And so I have something kind of cool to tell you guys. So this past, um, this past weekend, I was invited to the Raboli Center on Long Island to go see a lecture by um, a very famous woman. Her name is Victoria Wyeth, and it's Andrew Wyeth's only granddaughter. And so I went to this art history lecture, and it was so neat. I was able to um, ask questions about how one of my favorite artists, Andrew Wyeth, about how he worked. And so if you guys are interested in seeing Andrew Wyeth's work, ask your parents if you can look up Andrew Wyeth, have them look it up, and then look up like painting of dog or something like that. Um, so Andrew Wyeth did this painting uh, back in the day, and the painting um, is absolutely beautiful. It's the painting is of a dog laying on a bed, and in the history of art, it's it's always been it's always been one of my favorite paintings. So what I'm actually doing right now is I am grabbing the file so that I could show you guys this painting. And so this this painting, again, it's, it's one of my very favorite works of all time. And let me see if I can pull this up here for you. And it's not gonna be in such a great resolution, I apologize about it. But that is the painting by Andrew Wyeth of a dog laying on the bed. And I just love it. I think it's such a great painting. I think it's like so sweet. And so it's one of, again, it's one of the most famous paintings like that Andrew Wyeth ever did. And so I was talking to Andrew Wyeth's daughter and uh, granddaughter, I should say. And she said, oh, you like that painting? She's like, you should come to my house up in Maine. And if you visit, just send me a message. Um, you can come over to my house, we can hang out. I'll show you that painting. I actually have, hang, have it hanging on the wall of my house. So it's one of the most famous paintings that every museum in America would fight over having that painting in the collection. And I get to see it in person at Victoria's house. So I'm really excited about that. Let's jump over to our drawing and see if we can finish this guy up here. So, okay. So we are back at the front paw, like right here. Let's say I made this a little bit too big over here. So I'm just gonna kind of chew away at that, erase that. And there is the front right there. Okay, there the body like turns like so. Now here is that front kind of like a claw. And then there are Tess's, I'll call them toes. They're not toes, but they're, they're, I'm gonna call them toes for our purpose today. So, so there is, okay, so Daniel was saying, can we see it please? And thank you. So, um, yeah, so I pulled that image up, but when I go see the, the painting, Daniel, I'll ask Victoria if she would ever be up for jumping into a Zoom call to talk to all of you guys. Um, that's something we could ask her. We could invite her onto the call. And she literally, she's one of the most famous art figures in the whole entire country, in all of America, she'd be considered one of those famous um, art figures for sure. And it was so nice talking to her. So like, what's the harm in me asking her 
if she would jump on and talk to you guys about how her grandfather worked. Wouldn't that be cool, guys? I feel like that'd be a lot of fun. All right, so let's try to see if we can get like a few more defining characteristics of Tess. So Tess has like kind of like, kind of like these like, a little bit of a dark area, like right under her eye right here. Maybe I made it too pronounced. She has a little bit more dark right there above her eye. Um, her whole face is in shadow, so my hands are still dirty, which is a good thing. And so what I'll do is I will, sh I will shade in her face by using my dirty graphite covered fingers to send it further into shadow. Now, if light is striking from here and her face is in shadow over here, if light's coming from here, well then we have a trick up our sleeves that we've used many times in the past where we can shade in the background over here to make the light feel stronger on her right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab some graphite powder, put it on my finger right here, and I'm gonna shade in the background. You guys can do this with a pencil if you want. I love graphite powder because it gets me to my point really nice and quick. So just like this, just shading that in. All right, so there we go. We have that like shaded in. So you can feel this kind of like starting to pop off. Now what I'm gonna do is I'll get a little bit of a darker pencil and I'll get a little bit more specific about how that shading just kind of comes right up to her body right there. Remember, we have a, a trick up our sleeves that we always use in our drawings. And the trick up our sleeves is that we, we go dark on light. And the dark on light allows the light to lift off of, the, of Tessa's form. So dark on light, and then we can go light on dark over here. We should keep this pretty light over here. Like maybe I'll go a tiny bit dark up against her body right here. But then over on this side, we can let her get pretty dark down here. And we'll even go dark in here so that it feels like her body is like casting a shadow. Like so. This leg over here would kind of cast a bit of a shadow. I like working by natural light when I can. So she's sitting beneath a window and that window is casting a shadow right here. And so you can see how all these cast shadows kind of like cause her to lift off a little bit, lift off the page. So, all right, so now I'm grabbing a huge, huge blending stick because with this blending stick, I can kind of like calm this down. Sometimes I like crazy backgrounds, but sometimes I want them to be a little bit more unified so that they don't overpower my drawing. So this kind of like blends everything in nicely. If you don't have a blending stick, you can actually improvise by getting, I'm sure everyone on this call can get themselves a piece of paper towel. And you can grab your paper towel and you can go like that. You can use a paper towel. You can even use your hand. Or you can roll up a piece of paper and in twirling a piece of paper, you can kind of turn that into a blending stick. Like it's any way that you can figure out of getting the graphite to just kind of like blend a little bit. I'm gonna do it a little bit in her ear right here. So it takes away from kind of like that staticky look, a little bit in her eye, a little bit in her nose. Okay, we have to, we can't end this call without one last thing. We gotta put in her tail curling over right here. So there is Tessa's tail kind of coming off around back and she's laying on this plush bed. Maybe we'll even indicate her royalty, her bed right here. And there's the back of her bed, like right there. And with that, again, we could take this drawing and we could push it much further, but I like to take time to talk to all of you guys about your drawings. I love to see your drawings. I love to see them held up. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first, before you hold up your drawings, I'm gonna call Tess over. So let's see if we can get Tess up off of her bed. Hey, Tess. Yeah, you. Hey, hey, Tess. See her wagging her tail? <laughs> Tess, come on over. She's licking her paw. Come on, Tess, come on over here. 
come here. Hey. And Tess. All right. Tess hates more than anything being lifted up. So, come here, Tess. You gotta finish up this call. Let's get her on this call. All right. So what I'm gonna do is have you guys hold up your drawings. Um, if you could put your name in big letters, upload those drawings to the website. I'll take a look at them. We can all talk about them. And I'll upload my drawing when it's done. Uh, today, I did a huge drawing of a deer antler. And do you guys have a minute for me to pull it down to show you? Give me one minute. I'm gonna show you a drawing of a deer. And while you're waiting, you can look at Tess as she turns her back to you. She's feeling pretty antisocial today. I just love showing you what I'm up to so that you guys can enjoy it. So here is my drawing that I just did today. And this is a lesson that you guys can actually do. And if you can draw something like this, then you can learn how to draw something like a dog because it actually tells you like the structure of the head and things of that sort. And so Eventually, as you go through the courses, you start to learn like more advanced techniques, like working with chalk, working with like different things on toned paper. So keep going with the website, guys. So much fun to work with you.